Happy Sabbath to everyone. I think I would like to uh, introduce uh, the sermon with a short testimony. Uh, because this was back in June. Uh, I went to Brussels in Europe with my daughter. So we were traveling together. I was invited to make presentations on religious freedom. By the way, a parenthesis. I was introduced as Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty. So I guess that this church has to invite me again so that I can address that topic specifically. Uh, today, I, the Lord put in my heart to share something else. But anyway, in June, I was in Europe uh, with my daughter, and I start having shortness of breath, like uh, when I was walking up, uh, up the hill. Now, I didn't make much of it. We, w we went back to the States, and there it continued. My daughter is studying medicine uh, in uh, California. And when she heard that I was having shortness of breath, she told my wife to take me immediately to, to the hospital, Johns Hopkins. And guess what? I spent eight weeks at the hospital. What I had, some people thought that I had a heart attack, but no, it was not a heart attack. It is what is called myocarditis. You know, our heart... Uh, maybe next time I will do the health, you know. Our heart has several chambers with different functions. And one of those functions is to redistribute the oxygenated blood uh, elsewhere, you know, to the organs. Now, that muscle got, uh, basically, it was an inflammation. Why? How did it happen? The, the cardiologist says that probably it may have been a virus. You know, uh, and this condition is called myocarditis. Myocarditis. If you Google it, you will realize, you know. But this condition can basically be uh, treated with medication. I don't need any, you know, like, pace or something like that. In any event, the Lord really made a miracle because it could have been fatal. Uh, many people who have this condition do not survive it. But somehow the Lord thought that he's not done with me yet. I was literally at the door of death. Now, I have to tell you, what is it that really encouraged me during that time? Eight weeks in a hospital. Of course, I was thinking all the time. And actually, uh, my uh, wife and daughter were smiling. Because the first thing I wrote, when, uh, you know, when I uh, regained consciousness, was Hebrew, actually. I was writing Hebrew and Greek because this is how I trained my mind in order to uh, learn the scripture. In, in any event, it was just wonderful. Probably the most humbling part is I received messages from literally all over the world, brothers and sisters, telling me that they were praying for me. So all of a sudden, I uh, realized my family, the Adventist Church, is a global family. And I have brothers and sisters everywhere praying for me. Now, I must tell you, to be fair, even non-Adventists were praying for me also. So um, I am very humbled. And I promise the Lord that since he, ga he gave me an extension of life, 
that I will spend every day reflecting on the scripture and sharing the scripture. But while I was at the hospital, what is it that really sustained me? And this is my testimony. You know, where I, when I was laying on my bed at the hospital, the most meaningful word to me and that encouraged me daily were, were the words of Jesus. You know, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Then I tell myself, well, then I am in good hands. No matter what happens to me, I am in good hands. And I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Those are not just words for me today. They sustain me when I was about to die. So I am just grateful that Jesus revealed himself throughout the scripture. So today, allow me to just briefly talk to you about Jesus Christ. And... Uh, and the text I will start with is Matthew 28. Now we use this a lot when we talk about evangelism. Interestingly, uh, I will come back here in November to uh, train some pastors because we are going to have a special effort for government officials and so forth. And uh, of course, when people ask me, what is it that you preach? Is it the three angels' messages? And I say, no, what I preach is Jesus, because Jesus is the good news. Jesus is the gospel. The gospel is not a theory, it is a person. Now here, and this is based on Matthew 28, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now think about it. All authority. And this happens exactly right after the resurrection. Who in the world can say that I have defeated death? Nobody but Jesus. And this is the foundation of the Christian faith. Jesus has conquered death. And because of that, we have, the, we have a future. So here he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, and this is called the Great Commission, but sometimes we forget what is the content of this Great Commission because it's go therefore. The first thing we remember, make disciples. And of course, our church is keen in emphasizing on the necessity and I am delighted that ECD uh, in this, I think you have what, 5 million people now? 5.5. And you have even pledged that you want to double that number, I have heard somewhere. In, uh, in, in any event, it's important, Jesus says, go therefore make disciples of all nations. Now this is comprehensive, the whole world. Baptizing them. Now, this is very important, baptize. What does it mean and why do we baptize? Before I elaborate on that, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now notice, everyone baptized is baptized in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. What does it mean? You know, and uh, before I develop that, verse 20 now says, teaching them. Probably this is the most neglected part of the Great Commission. Teaching them all that I commanded you. This aspect is vital. Teaching what Jesus taught. But even Christians everywhere forget about the teachings of Jesus. And I want to illustrate that briefly. And then Jesus finished this great, great commission with a promise. Actually, I should not even preach today because we, have, we had a preacher earlier 
a young, what is his name, by the way? Moremi. Okay. Thank you so much, Moremi, for being my John the Baptist today. You know, so he, uh, so God, God can be trusted because God keeps his promises. I think the message was clear and powerful. Now, Jesus, all authority, he sent us to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he insists, I teach everything that I commanded. I am with you always. Now, this is the gospel of Matthew. Matthew is the gospel that explain Jesus in a unique way. Every gospel is like that. But Matthew, remember, he finishes by, by a promise. Jesus said, I will be with you. I am with you always. So that means God's presence with us always. He will not abandon us. He will not forsake us. But you have to remember at the beginning of the gospel, Jesus is called what? Emmanuel, God with us. That was the beginning of the gospel. At the end, he reiterated this by saying, I am with you. So the Emmanuel, God with us, here he promises that he will fulfill it. But I need to go any further, uh, I mean a little further, talking about Jesus. Who is Jesus Christ? Why is he unique? Now, of course, I can say Jesus is God's self-revelation. God, nobody has ever seen. But God decided to reveal God's self through Jesus Christ. And this is God's full revelation. Nobody explains God the way Jesus does. Why? Because he is God. Now, let's start with his name. God was very intentional by saying to Joseph and Mary, you shall call his name what? Jesus. Why Jesus? You know, in, in English, Jesus doesn't mean anything. Why? Because it is from a transliteration of a Greek, Jesus. In Greek, Jesus doesn't mean anything either. Why? Because it is transliterated from Hebrew, Yehoshua. Now, the word Yehoshua is, is enlightening because you have two components in that name. I'm talking about Jesus and who God wanted us to think about when we think about Jesus. Now, the first component is Yeho. And the, the same name is Yahweh. Now, that word comes from a Hebrew word to be, the word haya, to be. In other words, God is the one who is. You see, you and I, we can be conjugated. Yesterday, as I was flying, flying to Nairobi, I can say, I was, right? Today, I, as I speak, I can say I am. But tomorrow, what do you think? What, what do you say? Tomorrow, I don't know. That's the truth. Every day is grace. It's a miracle that we are alive. I have no guarantee that when I sleep tonight, I will wake up tomorrow. But God is not, is not dependent on anything. God is. He was and he will be. Actually, that is how the book of Revelation describes this. The one who was, who is, and who is to come. G Jesus Christ. So, the name Jesus then is the one who is. That means the everlasting one. The eternal one. 
So, and then the second component of the name is from another verb, yesha, uh, that means to save. So the name of Jesus simply means the everlasting one has come to save us. Now, that's the whole program. Jesus is the everlasting one, God, who comes to save us. It's not an angel that saves us. It's not a creature that saves us. God, God's self, saves us. So, you see, even the name is telling us of God's being and God's purpose. That is God's program of salvation. Uh, <laughs> I will just take a few minutes to illustrate what is the Bible? Now, the Bible is actually the story of redemption, we say. But let's take it simply, the story of, of salvation. The whole Bible. Let me take you to the book of Exodus. God tell Moses to go to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So that is what? Liberation. Again, as I say, I will not talk about freedom today, some other time. Go to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. That is the first theme of the book of Exodus, liberation. But here is the problem. The liberation is announced, but it is not fulfilled. Why? Because Pharaoh refused. He resisted. He pushed back. So the ten plagues, and after the ten plagues, last plagues, then, then Pharaoh give in. And the children of Israel were liberated from Egypt. Freedom. However, when they were liberated from Egypt, they, they had a special appointment with God at Sinai for a covenant. And the covenant, God gave Israel a gift, the Ten Commandments. Now, there is a mistake many people make. They think the Ten Commandments are to restrict our freedom. No. The Ten Commandments were given so that we may maintain ourselves within freedom. It is like God is saying, listen, I have liberated you from Egypt. If you want to remain free, don't have another God before me. If you want to be free, do not make graven images. They are beneath your dignity. Keep your freedom. If you want to remain free and benefit from the freedom that I give you, God says, do not take my name in vain. Don't try to manipulate me. You know, a lot of people have a superstition religion. They think God, the more than they pray, God will give them this or that. God is not bound to anything. God is gracious. God is good all the time. Anyway, that's part of God's nature. Right? So, and God say, um, now if you want to remain free, keep the Sabbath. Why? Because the Sabbath reminds you your dignity. You were created in the image of God. Every person. And by the way, I will develop that this week. You know, because we are created in God's image, we are sacred people. Temples. You know, but people respect more temples than human beings. Is, isn't that tragic? But every person, even the person sitting beside you right now, is a habitation of God, the Holy Spirit, temple of the Holy Spirit. This is the reason why when you are baptized, you are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, who gives new life, by the way, the name of your church. New life. Now, so, liberation, covenant, in the book of Exodus and worship. Because then God said, let them make me a sanctuary and I will dwell in their midst. 
So the whole book of Exodus, you find these three themes, freedom, liberation, covenant, and then worship. And that is what we Seventh-day Adventists share with the world. Freedom, right? That's part of our DNA. Covenant, that's why the Sabbath for us is not legalism, but it is to affirm our freedom, actually. In, uh, interestingly, uh, <laughs> when is the Independence Day for, Ke for Kenya? December 12th. Now, Seventh-day Adventists have every Sabbath an Independence Day. That's the gift from God. Every Sabbath, we are to remember God is the one who free us. Not just creation in God's image, yes. Human dignity, yes. But also freedom. That's why God gave us the Sabbath. Not for legalistic purposes, but for the perpetuation of freedom. Reminding us, yes, our dignity, yes, we are special to God, but also the fact that we are free by God. Now, this being said, let's come back to Jesus. What is it that he came to do? Now, of course, we could take several biblical passages. I have come so that they may ha have life and have it abundantly. Now, when I was about to die, I remember that. Lord, you are the giver of life. If it is your will, I will survive this. And I, that's my testimony. I praise God that he snatched me out of death. You know, I was born in a small country, Senegal, and I used to say, God snatched me out of darkness to his marvelous light so that I may proclaim the, excellency of, the, the excellencies of Jesus. And I can say the same thing. He is the giver of life to each one of us, a, a daily miracle. You know, I had to go through what I went through to realize that my goodness, God is performing daily miracles so that we may, you know. By the way, just for, uh, cl for, cl for clarity purpose, I told you that what I had was not a heart attack, but I had what is called a myocarditis. And that, you know, like one muscle uh, of the heart was not fun functioning very well. And that is treatable and I take medication, and you know, that takes care of things. And I didn't know in June whether I would be able to travel, come to Kenya, but God saw it, you know, uh, otherwise. So gave me, I was supposed to travel with my wife, but she could not make it, uh, uh, unfortunately. But I say, the God who took care of me is gonna take care of me and give me strength to go there and share what you want me to share. So I am just a grateful person and uh, I am humbled because even at the general conference, three people died recent, since the beginning of the year. Three, you know. Why is it that God spared my life? Not because I am better than them, no, but part of God's mystery to say, you know, you have to do some more work for me. And I'm just grateful. If I had died, I, I would have been in good hands anyway. We are not afraid of death. But God saw to it that uh, he just, uh, you know, that, okay, I will uh, give you an extra time to serve me in this world. So I'm just grateful and privileged to serve God. Now, what did Jesus want to do when he came? You see, he said, all power has been given. He asked us to make disciples of all nations. But for what purpose? Let me be very clear. It is for the purpose of creating a new humanity. 
Jesus want to create a new humanity. That is why he called his disciples. And you see, if you come to the book of um, Matthew, it is very, I mean, amazingly structured. You have five sermons of Jesus in this Gospel of Matthew. And by the way, Matthew was primarily, I mean, at the beginning, writing for Jews. What is interesting here is that five sermons, the Sermon on the Mount is one of them. And then you have a story of miracle, another speech, and then another story, five. Because Matthew was telling the Jews, this is the new Torah now gi given to us. Five discourse of Jesus. But there is more. This is fascinating. You know, the Bible is rich, but sometimes we just pick here and there and forget that there is an internal logic. Now, Jesus came to create a new humanity. Now, you are comfortable with this because he told Nicodem, you must be what? Born again. Right? You must be born again. Or the Gospel of John. To those who believe in him, he has given the authority, the power, to become what? Children of God. Right? So again, a new humanity. And there is another way that Jesus showed what this new humanity consists of. You see, the Gospel of Matthew begins, begins how? With the name Jesus Christ, son of David, and son of Abraham. Nothing is by chance in, in the scripture. Why son of David? Because God made a promise to David that his throne will never lack a descendant upon him, uh, upon it. So Matthew is telling the Jews the promised king has arrived. His name Jesus. And then son of Abraham. There too, God made a promise to Abraham. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you and through your descendants. By the way, let me open a parenthesis. Why did God choose us as Seventh-day Adventists? Not because we are better, but because we are called to be blessings to others. Let's never forget that. We are not chosen just because of privileges. Yes, except the privilege to be a blessing to other people. Seventh-day Adventists should be blessings to other people. And I used to say, Adventists should be the kindest people. Why? Because they have the Holy Spirit. The most caring people. If that is not the case, then it is totally irrelevant. So I encourage you, new life, to live according to your new life of being blessings to others. Whoever meets a Seventh-day Adventist from New Life should testify, oh, these people are really special. These people really bless our lives. They are polite. They are caring. They have the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, See? Faithfulness and temperance, meaning basically uh, self self control. But now I want to say here, Jesus come to recapitulate, to relieve the history of humanity, the whole human family. This is not just about us, it's about the whole human family. How can I say that? Jesus is called the second Adam. Because where Adam fell, Jesus succeeded and became victorious. Now, not only the second Adam, he is also 
the new Israel. Let me give you a few examples shortly. Now, you remember Israel went to Egypt. Jesus went to Egypt. Is it by chance? Twelve tribes. Jesus called twelve disciples. Is it by chance? Seventy elders. Send them. Two by two, seventy. But it's not just that. Jesus is the new Moses. Think about it. Moses went up on the mountain to receive the, the law. Jesus did not have to receive the law. You know, all the prophets said, this says the Lord. Jesus never had to say, this says the Lord. You know why? He is the Lord. He would say, Amen. I tell you. I tell you. So he, is co he has come to reveal the meaning of God's revelation. Now, it is interesting, but he is not just the new Moses, he is also the new Joshua, the one who lead God's people to the promised land. This is why in the book of Hebrews, he is called the Archegos in Greek, the arch leader. Argo is to lead. So Jesus is the one who takes us. You know, there is a movement in the Bible. Terah, the father of Abraham, left Ur of Chaldean to, the, to, I mean, to Canaan. So he led his family. Even though he did not reach Canaan, Abraham left. Moses left, right, to reach Canaan. But, Joshua, but nobody leave according, according to the promise that really God wanted. Establish them in the promised land. So, but Jesus is the one who takes us to the heavenly Canaan. Again, he is the only one who can do that. Why? He is the only one who has conquered death. Now, but there is something else. Jesus recapitulates the story of Israel. He is the new Israel in the fact that, remember, even, and there are so many examples of that, right? Israel went to Egypt, Jesus went to Egypt. Israel came out of Egypt, Jesus came out of Egypt. I call my son out of Egypt. So, uh, uh, Israel spent 40, what? 40 years, right, in the desert. It is not by chance Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights, 40. And I talked to you about the 12 disciples, the 70. Now, if you look at all this, why, why this correspondence? It's because Jesus came to be the new Israel, to, to fulfill our destiny. By the way, this is also the reason why every person in this building this morning Please, never underestimate who you are. Never. It is insulting to God if you belittle yourself, if you think you are nothing. Don't listen to some people who will judge you or who only consider you when you perform well. No. Jesus came, and this is the function of the genealogy, even Rahab, uh, you know, or a people of ill repute, Jesus came and embraced them, uh, you know, even prostitute and so forth, to say nobody is beyond God's forgiveness and God's outreach and God's, and God's sanctification. So again, and this Jesus is what the world needs today. You see, when people ask me, uh, what is the gospel. I mean, this is simple. What is the gospel? Simply, and I think, I hope, every member of this church, every person, and those listening, you can answer this question very simply. 
The gospel is the good news of salvation. But wait, salvation from what? In one word, salvation from evil. And this is the reason why Jesus taught us, even in our prayer, to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive, uh, forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but what? Deliver us from evil. So in other words, even Jesus uh, clarifies, help us to pray that what we, what we really need to be delivered from, the good news is deliverance from evil. And interestingly, even in the book of Genesis, the first gospel is when God says here, you know, the, the seed of the woman will what? Defeat the serpent. Again, deliverance from Satan, deliverance from the evil one, and ultimately deliverance from death. Now, regardless of what would have happened to me, I, am, I was confident that Jesus has the capacity, the power to, to deliver me from death, even death. He, he did it. I mean, Lazarus. And he, he promised that when he comes back, there are many, many mansions, right, in the Father's house. And there, where he would be, uh, we will be. This same Jesus in John 17 says very clearly, I don't pray that you take them from the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So in other words, and this is our gospel, we tell the world that Jesus, the Savior, you know, the seed of the woman, and as the Gospel of Luke puts it, Jesus is the Savior who delivers us, you know. So, and this Savior is coming again and to crush Satan and deliver us once for all for good, for, from, from all evil. I would like to, uh, earlier I told you in the book of Exodus, there were three things, remember? Liberation, covenant, and worship. Yes. So think about it. G uh, this liberation, covenant, and worship were framed in the context of the Exodus. God snatching, delivering his people out of Egypt, right? into the promised land. This is exactly what the book of Revelation is telling us about what Jesus, the, there is a final exodus that is coming. Jesus is coming to deliver his people from evil and once and for all. It will be the final exodus. It will be the final deliverance when Babylon or God's enemies will never oppress God's people any longer. Why? Because we will experience the final exodus. No wonder that in the book of Revelation, the redeemed, the saved ones, are depicted as singing the song of Moses, right? And the song of the Lamb. You see, the Bible is consistent. The language is clear, but sometimes we make it complicated but it, it's very clear what Jesus is coming back to do. Actually, he is our hope. And if I, uh, let me just share with you one of the most extraordinary verses in the Bible. In the book of Timothy, Jesus is called himself, his person. He, he is our hope. So then, if Jesus is our hope, and we're waiting for him, we can say Jesus is really the good news, as a matter of fact. So, First uh, Timothy 1, Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, 
who is our hope. You know, when people ask me, what concept is the most emphasized by Adventists? I, you know, I use the word hope. Hope Channel, there are so many churches, you know, like hope. Uh, but our hope is really a person, Jesus. And that's why I talk to you today about him. This is the one that we have to share with the world, telling people in spite of the diseases, the pandemic and so forth, our hope is coming. He will defeat evil once and for all. Actually, he did it, even death, by resurrecting. But soon he will come back and put an end to human suffering. And the book of Revelation is clear. There will be no more mourning, weeping, crying, no more death. Why? Because Jesus is coming again. And this is humbly what we Seventh-day Adventists share with the world. We tell people, do not despair. Do not lose hope. Why? Because our hope, Jesus, is coming again. So again, uh, think of your life not just as, uh, you know, a chance. No. You are connected to Jesus. He is coming. To, he has lived your story. And not only he has succeeded where we have fallen. And not only that, Jesus, as a matter of fact, is, is telling us that he loves us so deeply that even he bore the penalty. You know, we are delivered from three things. The penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin soon when he will come and put an end to all evil. So I hope you will appropriate this message and to, to your neighbors, to all people, let them not think that we Adventists do not understand the gospel because there is one gospel and it is the, gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, Lord and Savior. And interestingly, he cannot be a savior if he was not Lord. You see, if he has to be Lord of time. Why? Because you could exist at some point in time, and if he is not eternal, he cannot save you. You see, uh, he is also Lord of space. No matter where you are in the world, he can reach out to you and save you. So Jesus is really our sufficiency, in other words. You know, I uh, travel a lot, and uh, in my travel, it's my responsibility to meet other Christians also, uh, even though this, this aspect of our work, unfortunately, is misunderstood. But let me just tell you this. Our work as PAL, and maybe during the question and answer later, I can expand a little more. This is like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So imagine a country without a Ministry of Foreign Affairs. See? So the Adventist Church has its Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and that is what Paul Department is. We represent the church in the public space, right? We are the face of the church to reach out to government officials, but also to other leaders, Christians, and religions. We don't share the same beliefs in everything, no. But we don't hate people, and we don't insult people. We are not, you know, zealous, th <laughs> zealous ter uh, you know, terrorists who think that the Adventist message is always about what's wrong with other people. It is not that. The Adventist message is what's right with God, Jesus Christ. Adventist, listen to this, seventh day, created in God's image, human dignity. Adventist, those who eagerly wait for the one who is coming to put an end to evil, to put an end to Satan, and to create a world where there will be justice and righteousness, where there will be no more suffering, no more pain, no more disease. I mean, 
if it will be over, it, it is another word. And this is what God promises to do. So my prayer for new life is that you embrace fully Jesus. I mean, you know, fully, because he is uh, all, all we need. And I was just telling you, in my meeting with other people, sometimes uh, Catholics will ask me, Dr. Diop, why don't you recognize the leadership of the Pope or the leadership of the Patriarch? I will say, we don't despise Catholics. We Seventh-day Adventists, J Jesus Christ is our sufficiency. We don't need any other leader but Jesus. And actually, this is the, that doesn't mean we despise people, no. In fact, we, we ought to be kind to other people, you know. So we, we don't insult. I mean, who is the accuser of the brethren? Satan. We don't want to have anything to do with him. Now, but we don't have to share their, their belief. I, I cannot believe in the supremacy of a human being. Why? Because Jesus Christ is our sufficiency. That is enough. But would that prevent me to be kind to Catholics, to Muslims, and you name it? No. And actually, next week, I will develop a little more. The continent of Africa, you have 49% of Christians in Africa and 41% of Muslims. And you know, there are some tensions in, uh, in some places. Uh, what is our role as Seventh-day Adventists? People of peace, let me say. Why? Because of the teachings of Jesus. I was telling you, and I would like to finish with that, the teachings of Jesus are the most neglected teaching. Now think about it. Jesus taught the first discourse, the Gospel of Matthew, the so-called Beatitude. This is really fantastic. Beatitude, the whole gospel, the teaching of the apostle, are all about, in substance, the teachings of Jesus. You know? In fact, the, even the Beatitude are a veiled portrait of Jesus. Think about it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Who was the poor in spirit? That means someone totally dependent on the Father. And this is our destiny, that we totally depend on God. Let's not think that our horizontal relationship is all that there is. No. We deal with God in everything. If someone comes and insults you, don't deal with that person that insults you, but with God. Lord, you know, <laughs> change the mindset of this person. When someone comes and insults me, I say, you have no idea how God loves me. You know? So I pray for the person. Because that is the, the Christian spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus is the poor per excellence. He did not even have where to lay his head. And when someone slander you, don't worry. Don't take it personally. But why? Because Jesus, he made himself poor, though he was rich. He emptied himself. He humbled himself to, to the point of death on the cross of Calvary. Think about it. And this same Jesus say, blessed are the meek, those who renounce violence. Seventh-day Adventists should have nothing to do with violence. That's why we don't insult people because that is demeaning of their human dignity. So Jesus completely renounced, re renounced violence. You know, he said, if he wanted, 12 legions of angels will fight for him. But he is not for violence. Blessed are those who weep. God's heart bleeds because of human suffering. And Jesus wept. That text was, blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty of righteousness. At his baptism, Jesus wanted to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus is the justice and the righteousness of God. So we ought to be passionate about, about justice. 
about, but more, more than justice, about righteousness. You know, uh, Jesus said a word that we don't think carefully. If your righteousness does not surpass that of the scribes and of the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter God's kingdom. You see, in, uh, in the world, some people will say, well, if someone insults you, you know, give it back, uh, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus says, even to love your enemies. That's the new humanity. It is not within our human natural capacities. But Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, makes that miracle in us. This world is eager to see Christians, Adventists, who really live according to the teachings of Jesus. Because if not, we are just using religion and being superstitious and all kinds of things. We don't need all that. What we need is to listen to the words of Jesus. In fact, blessed are the merciful, you know. Uh, in fact, be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Purity of heart is the rectitude of intention in all our behavior. And again, Jesus knew how to discern what is true and what is good. All his thoughts, intentions, and desires are right and righteousness. And that's why I must tell you, I, I, pre, I pray every day, Lord, cleanse my perception. Cleanse my way of even looking at other people. Help me to reflect your mindset, your mentality. See, again, a new humanity. Blessed as a peacemaker. Jesus was the prince of peace, the one who gives peace. How can I be violent with this teacher? How can I be a troublemaker with, with, with this? Instead of being a blessing, to uh, bestow peace to other people. Blessed are those who are persecuted uh, for justice sake. Some people think, you know, if you have trouble, then something must be wrong with you. No, no. In fact, if you are loyal to God, the enemy will do anything to try to sabotage, to basically mess up your, your life. But we trust God, you know, that he will, he, he will take care of us. Again, uh, I, I insist, a lot of people call themselves Christians. How can you be Christian and racist? It doesn't make sense, you know, and next week we're going to de develop. How can you be Christian and be nationalist? I mean, you know, my country and that's it. Uh, the, the, Jesus is betrayed in so many ways, even by those people who call, uh, he, who call themselves disciples. But not so for new life. You are going to exemplify the teachings of Jesus in, in the way that you relay to one, to, to one another. You know, always kind to other people, respectful. You know, I mean, these are basics of Christianity, but sometimes we, we indulge behaviors that have nothing to do with what the Lord taught us. Go into all the world, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, teaching them, don't forget that part, teaching them all that I have commanded you. And I am with you. So if we claim Jesus is with us, then we cannot betray his spirit, the mind of Jesus. So thank you so much to this church, the pastor, for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit. I hope to have encouraged you to know that you have a treasure in the Bible and you have a Lord and a Savior in, Je in, in Jesus Christ who will come soon to make all things new, to make all things right. God bless you, and may God continue to protect you, to, to give you health, to give you discernment, and may his Holy Spirit continue to enlighten you. 
and guide you in everything. God bless you. Amen. May I ask Pastor Okindo to come and pray for us so that we, Jesus Christ, help us to have our minds in our life, lives saturated with Jesus Christ because it's him that we share with others. Jesus is the message, actually. Thank you so much. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we have spent time in your presence this morning listening to your servant testifying about how you have revealed yourself to him. Not in a theological seminary class, not in a scholarly environment, not in a place where we are arguing about which religion is better than the other, which nation is better than the other, who is a better human being than the other, not in an atmosphere where we always argue back and forth about gender, about generations, which generation is better than the other generation. He has come to testify about Jesus, the one he met when he was about to die, what he meant to him, what became clear, the giver of life and the savior of life. He has spoken to us passionately that we should spend our time to know Jesus and to understand his teaching and to exemplify his teaching in our daily lives as we relate with other human beings. Lord, you have talked to us that you have raised up a church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and brought us in so that we can exemplify the teachings of Jesus in these last days. You have raised us up so that we can prepare the world for the coming of Jesus. Oh, Father, we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you transform us day by day to reflect Jesus Christ in our lives, to exemplify his teachings in our relationships. Our relationships among ourselves, among people of different faiths, among people of different nationalities, they hear about you in Christ, but may they experience you through us. May we exemplify you most clearly. This is your intention you had to raise us up as a remnant in these last days. Oh, may the Spirit of God make this clearer. Father, we finally know that in Christ we have life and life eternal. Though we face challenges in this life, though we even have our lives threatened, you have said, be comforted. I have saved you. And I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, will be alive again. And those who believe in me, even if they don't die, but they still have life in themselves. We thank you for listening to you through your servant's testimony. You have revealed to him that you have given him an extension of life to serve you. He understood this at the point of death. Help us to understand this every moment. That in you we live, we move and have our being. The gift of life that we have is an extension of your grace to us every day. And we want to use it the best we know how to bring you glory and honor. 
where we have failed you forgive us help us lord to be as loving as caring as 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 kind as jesus our lord help us to be transformed by his teaching to reflect who you really are and what you intended us to be when you created us transform this church to do the mission for which you call it to accomplish in these last days may we meditate upon what we have been reminded on and lord may there be a miracle every day as you transform us to be more like jesus the gospel the good news that the world is longing for people who are living dignified lives like jesus lived thank you father for hearing our prayer we don't know how to pray clearly enough but as you promised the spirit of god will do it for us bless your people and now may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us now and forevermore amen Thank you.